We are Locked On Houston Astros, and we hope that you join us for a daily Locked On Astros podcast. My name is Eric Heisman. You can find me on Twitter at Eric Talks Astros. You can find the show at Locked On Astros. Your team, every day, Brett the man. Where can they find you at? They can find me at H-Town Wheelhouse on Twitter, and that's Strohs411 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Always positive, always Strohs. All right, we have a special guest, uh, Joe Vasile. Is that how you say it? Yeah, and, it is. That's that's great. Yeah. And uh, when people butcher my name. They always say, like, Huisman. I'm like, yeah. it's Heisman, like the trophy. It's just not spelled the same way. But <laughs> um, you are doing an interesting podcast. And uh, I know that we have, we're just talking about Ben Ryder's The Edge podcast. Your podcast is kind of going around the same thing, but not focusing on Astros, but focusing on the life and eventually death, I'm assuming, of mm-hmm. Ken Caminetti. And uh, what is that called? Uh, it's called Secondary Lead. Um, and yeah, the first season is uh, The Rise and Fall of Ken Caminiti. It's uh, a 10 episode season. Um, just this week released our, our fifth episode, which uh, brings you up to speed on the, the 12 player trade where uh, I still remember that. Yeah, Caminiti and Finley go out to San Diego and things kind of take off for him after that. So kind of went through a lot of the early Astros years uh, so far. And uh, obviously 99 and 2000, the, uh, his second stint with the Astros still coming up um, with a couple of things that I had no idea about uh, just kind of all mixed in. It was, um, it was really interesting to see. Cause I, I feel like I'm a, like a lot of people who maybe weren't Astros fans or weren't Padres fans and didn't watch a ton of him growing up. Um, I was aware of him as a player, knew a very little bit of his story, and in researching it and talking to guys he played with, uh, was just blown away by so much about who he was, not only as a ball player, but as a person, as a teammate, as a father, um, and some of the the circumstances that uh, surrounded the, the demons that he had off the field as well. All right, guys, so we are Astros fans here. And if you're an Astros fan and you want to get locked on to Astros, why don't you uh, – you could do it on Podcast and App Himalaya as well as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. And when you get in car, tell your smart device to play the podcast, Locked on Astros. All right, so I know you kind of talked a little bit about it, but why Ken Caminiti? Uh, he was just a, a very fascinating – uh, kind of player like again I, I knew a little bit about him and a couple of years ago uh, saw a tweet from Craig Calcaterra um, where he just mentioned his name in passing and I saw it and I went oh there's a name I haven't thought of in a long time uh, and then I somehow went to his Wikipedia article and I was like oh there's I didn't realize that and then read an article and read another article and was like man I, I really would love to like read a book or watch a 30 for 30 about him. There's gotta be something. And there was nothing. Um, And so I was very um, probably a little arrogant and thinking like, Oh, maybe I'll do something on him someday. Um, You know, and I'm a, I'm a play-by-play broadcaster. I work in minor league baseball and college sports. And so I knew I was never going to have time to do any major biographical project on anyone. And then COVID happened um, and the minor league season got canceled and I was looking for something to do to keep me busy. Um, And a lot of my colleagues are starting podcasts and decided, all right, I'd like to try to do one as well. I'm a baseball history enthusiast and uh, I wanted it to be somewhat different and kind of landed on Ken Caminiti as being the subject of it because Um, I I live right outside of New York, grew up a Mets fan, um, and was watching an old Mets game, Mets Braves, the first game after September 11th back at Shea Stadium. And at that point, Ken Caminiti was playing for the Braves in 2001. Um, And so he was in their lineup that day, and I saw him play, and I went, that's that's what I'm doing. Uh, And so then it was just a bunch of research from there, and the more I got into it, the more mind blowing it was that nobody had ever put something comprehensive together on him other than, you know, a couple articles on Bleacher Report or Sports Illustrated over the years. 
Yeah, he's an intriguing player um, in Houston Astros history. I know for us, you know, growing up, um, I came into my fandom, I think, a lot sooner than, you know, Eric did. Um, gosh, my my first game, I was two, and I was taken to the Astrodome, and I grew up going to the Astrodome. I grew up sitting in the outfield seats, sitting in the rainbow seats. I remember when we had the big scoreboard. I remember when they took part of the scoreboard down. People hated that. But I remember Ken Caminetti, and I remember Ken Caminetti literally diving for balls to his right and picking the ball up and not even getting up on his feet and throwing guys out at first across the diamond on his knees, literally getting chill bumps thinking about it. Because I remember as a young kid, you know, 88, 89, I was, I was a fresh eighth grader, freshman in high school, and just enamored by this guy's arm. And I remember having conversations with my dad, asking my dad, because my dad's favorite third baseman growing up was Brooks Robinson. And yeah. I said, dad, is Ken Caminetti better than Brooks Robinson? And we had those discussions. And um, he did have those demons that we later found out about. Um, I, I kind of share some stories a little bit about Ken Caminetti. Um, he used to come to our hometown football games. I grew up in Crosby, Texas. And I think he had some land or something out there where he lived. But he, he always seemed to me almost a little almost a little standoffish. And what he had like this exterior from everything I've heard from everybody has said he was very kind and very generous, but the few times I met him, um, it was, it was just kind of a weird um, like encounter. And, mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if when I met him, if he was dealing with things or he was going through things or he was, I don't know, under the influence of something, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah hearing the stuff come out about him um i'm just intrigued by your 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 opening episodes you're talking about the pulling the iv out of his arm and hitting the home runs and yeah. then going back in the in the clubhouse so what to you has been the most intriguing thing that you found out about ken caminetti in your research um i, I mean you, you you talked about it right there there was a, a game when he was with um when was it san diego in 96 his mvp year uh, where he was dehydrated, was dealing with food poisoning, and uh, was hooked up to an IV drip in Bruce Bochy's office. And then, according to this, is how Tony Gwynn tells the story. And then I've I've seen interviews of him where, where Ken kind of recounts the story. Like five minutes before the game, takes the IV out of his arm, goes runs down to the field, throws a couple balls, uh, eats a Snickers bar, hits two home runs, and then comes out of the game in the fifth inning. Um, and then has to get hooked back up to the IV because he's just so dehydrated. Uh, it's like a superhuman thing. Um, I didn't realize he played his entire MVP year in 96 with a torn rotator cuff. Um, and again, obviously, we know now that the reason why he was able to win MVP with a torn rotator cuff is because he was uh, using performance-enhancing drugs that season, which is one of the biggest... I think parts of obviously his baseball story um, and frankly, his life story um, and, and because of the importance that I think that, that it gives him in the historical context of baseball, but just some of those feats are, you know, whether there were steroids involved in them or not, like things that would have kept a normal player out of a game. Th there was no, so like literally you would have to like fight to keep him out of the lineup. Like, um, 99, his first year back with the Astros, he had this apparently mysterious calf injury that he thought was a strain, was trying to play through it, and he just couldn't. Turned out he was playing on like a torn calf for like a month. And like, it's, again, it's something that, of course, yes, steroids are helping with that, but still like for a normal person, like to try to gut through that is incredible. Unfortunately, I think that that attitude probably worked against him when he was dealing with some of the substance abuse things as well. Um, and you could kind of see how that same mentality worked for him as a ball player and worked against him in some of the other areas of his life. Um, but yeah, just seeing some of the, the individual things like the rocket arm that he had at third base that you mentioned um, was just stunning to watch some of those defensive highlights. Um, it's just really, really incredible. Well, I think that uh, maybe if uh, Bilt Bar was around back then, then maybe instead of a Snickers bar, he would eat a Bilt Bar. 
Brett, why don't you go tell us about that? You know, Built Bar is not just a protein bar. It is wrapped in 100% chocolate. It tastes like a candy bar, and their flavors even surprise you even more. Like I said, my favorite is carrot cake. And what does it have in it? It tastes like carrot cake, and it has walnuts. Those are two things I don't like to eat on the regular. But in a Built Bar carrot cake form, I absolutely love it. And I'm not, this isn't false advertising, this is legit. I asked my wife, did you order the carrot cake box or the strawberry box? And if it's a carrot cake box, I'm even doubly more happy about that. Because what happens, you get 17 grams of protein. You only get four grams of carbs, typically four grams of sugar. Um, all of them less than 200 calories per bar. And you they don't like fill you up, Eric. They're not like overwhelming. Like you didn't feel like you're eating a second meal. You can eat them before a workout, during a workout, or after a workout. They're great for the healthy conscious guy. They're great for those who want to lose or maintain weight. And if you act now, go to BuiltBar.com. Use the promo code Locked On. You'll get 20% off your first box. Go to BuiltBar.com. It's the best bar in the business. I just want to say to everyone listening, these guys are just that good at segues. <laughs> they didn't run that by me. Like, that wasn't me trying to set them up. They're just that good at segueing right in. I'm very <laughs> impressed by that. That was great. I, I don't even notice. I don't even know if y'all noticed, but when you said Snickers, I went, <gasps> <laughs> Yes. I kind of, I kind of knew what was coming. I knew it was coming. <laughs> anyway, speaking of knowing what's coming, I know um, there's no spoilers here. We all know how it ended. Uh, but, and I don't want you to, you to give too much away from that trade, but I actually remember that I, I want to say it was July when that 14 player trade went down. Um, what, re, what did you learn about the players involved or Kenton Caminiti and everything that was involved in that big, massive trade? Yeah, so that was um, that trade actually happened during the strike uh, in 1994 uh, in December. Like oh, the Padres, the Padres had just gotten bought by uh, a guy by the name of John Moores, who was actually from Houston and, and bought the Padres. Um, and then a week later, they pulled this big deal that's essentially for the Astros a salary dump. Um, at that point, Major League Baseball owners were imposing a salary cap in the game, which is something I had no idea existed until I started researching this. Um, but they had put in a cap. Um, they were getting ready to declare an impasse with the players and the strike and just plunge ahead with the salary cap. And so Bob Watson realized he needed to cut payroll. So he went to Craig Biggio, he went to Jeff Bagwell and said, hey guys, can we restructure your contract so we can get under the cap number? And they did. And then he went to Steve Finley and Ken Caminiti and they both were like, no, I'm good. Um, and, and for Caminiti, I, I can't speak to Finley, but um, I get it because for years and years in his first stint, like he was always at the middle of trade rumors they had just drafted Phil Nevin. So he's looking at this like, they don't have any faith in me. They've got my replacement sitting in AAA. Like, they clearly don't feel any loyalty to me. So why am I going to help them out by taking a, you know, two and a half million dollar salary cut? So he's just like, I'll just play out my contract and then look to whatever after 95. And obviously that wouldn't do. So he starts calling around looking for trades and eventually lands on San Diego where Caminiti, Finley, and a couple other guys end up going there. Phil Plantier and Derek Bell really highlight my bell. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> coming on back. Um, and, uh, and so essentially it was something where the Astros saved, I think it was like five and a half million dollars on the payroll for 95. And then of course, the salary cap goes away and never actually stays in place. So it's a trade that never had to happen um, right. and was completely unnecessary. And it's one of those like many moments throughout, and maybe you guys realize this, but th that I've learned, you know, where the Astros could have been a much different team in the late nineties um, with just a couple of different decisions there in the year, in like 91 to 94, um, not trading Kurt Schilling for Jason Grimsley, drafting Derek Jeter instead of Phil Nevin. Like, I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry if I'm opening up wounds, but um, like, yeah, Kenny I, you look too. at that, it's like, whoa. Um, 
No, yeah. You know, I remember Phil Nevin. Um, I actually still, I can probably find it. I mean, of course, everything's still packed away. I think he used that excuse last time. Um, we just we just moved to a new house um, a few months ago. But I still have some of my old, some of my original binders, binders that I had from growing up. And I still got like my Frank Thomas, my Chipper Jones. Mm-hmm. I have I have a bunch of Phil Nevin cards. And I remember the hype around Phil Nevin that he was going to come up and be this big power hitter. He's going to be like the next generation guy. And you know, and um, it was funny. I was I was looking at the guys in this trade, and it's funny. Um, I'm reading an article by um, one of the more local guys, and he says, "And pitcher Pedro Martinez, no, not that Pedro Martinez." <laughs> yeah. um, but um, you know, the Astros sent Andujar Sedania, who I remember yep. very well. There was there was a lot of hope for him. Brian Williams, there was a lot of hope for him. They thought he was going to be something else, and he never panned out. And so. Um, you, you look at this and you wonder, had they not made that trade, Mm -hmm. what would have been? Because Ken Caminetti, I think was grounded when he had Biggio and Bagwell and he had these guys around him. And I think they're kind of party animals too. I mean, they may not have been doing the same stuff, but uh, I've heard some stories about them. Well, no, they were, but I think though, emotionally, I think at the end of the day, emotionally, even with the partying and stuff, Bijou, you, you know, I don't know. I mean, do do you think Ken Kim and Eddie's life? Of course, this is purely hypothetical. Mm-hmm. Do you think his life would have taken the same trajectory, um, just because of what he fought if he had stayed with the Astros? You know, there's there's a lot of different points in his life, and and that trade is one of them um, that I've thought about in the last you know seven months as I put this together of man, if this went different, would it have changed anything? And to be honest, I I don't know because, you know, he goes to San Diego, comes back after the 98 season and is then back in Houston um, and things are just different. And he ends up getting in with, uh, frankly, a very bad crowd um, in Houston to the point where like, especially in the years after he retires from baseball and he's still living in Houston. Uh, I mean, there's quotes from his, his parents, his, uh, of like, I need to get him out of Houston. There's too many bad influences there. Mm. Um, so I, I don't know, uh, it is really the best thing. It's very easy to like, look at one person or one event and say, well, maybe that would have set things off on a different path. But I, I think at the end of the day, you know, he was someone who was struggling with a disease and he had a severe enough case of it that the course that it ran is the course that it runs in, I mean, millions of people. Um, And I mean, you had Biggio, you had Bagwell and many others within and outside of baseball doing everything they possibly could to try and help him. Um, And they really wanted to, and they loved him. And even that just wasn't enough at the end of the day so it's really really hard to say um how things might have played out differently if not for certain events along the way whether it was him leaving houston coming back to houston um or anything else that ended up happening from there on out is this is this one of these stories eric let me jump in here real quick is this one of these stories where you think um would be good for maybe um you know, young up and coming players to listen to, because, you know, um, I've heard from um, former students of mine, I was youth pastor for years. I had a couple of students that would, um, they were in the minor leagues. They played a couple of seasons of major league ball, didn't really have long careers, but, you know, they had respectably um, obtained being on, on, on major league clubs. And I heard stories of, of the temptation of even in the minor leagues of just the opportunity. And then you hear the story of, you know, Josh Hamilton and what happened to him. Do you think something like this is a good thing for young ball players that are aspiring major leaguers to hear someone who had such great potential and ultimately succumb to the things that um, controlled his life to make sure that they don't make, you know, the wrong choices going down the road? I think so. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very, like I said, it, it's a very tragic kind of a, of a tale and, and, you know, you do see where there are those trappings of fame when you have a lot of people around you who maybe are not there for the right reasons. Um, they're there as hangers on and 
I think that that is a lot of what happened with Ken, um, especially in his years after baseball, once he was no longer playing. And then that just kind of became the crowd he was hanging around. It was, hey, this is a guy that I know he can, you know, a lot of people took advantage of him. Um, I, I will say that. Um, and that probably contributed as much as anything to how things ultimately ran their course. Um, and so I think that it is, it's important, I mean, for everyone, but I think especially for, yeah, if, if it's a young ball player to, maybe the lesson isn't necessarily like, be careful of, you know, partying and things like that. Because I think that a lot, especially now, teams kind of control that and, you know, make sure guys are well educated on these things. But it's almost, you know, be careful of who you surround yourself with. Um, because again, there might be a lot of people who want to be around you, not for the right reasons. Yeah. And, uh, it, it just kind of brings back a lot of memories, just kind of talking about it. And my question is, uh, where do you get all this information? Did you just talk to people or did you read just a bunch of internet articles, a bunch of quotes? Where did you get all the information for this documentary? Yeah, it's a, it's a combination. Um, I interviewed about a, a dozen people, um, former teammates, um, coaches, uh, media members, just people, and a couple of people who knew him in non-baseball um, fashion. Uh, and then, yeah, read a ton of articles, just going through like old newspaper archives, uh, you know, reading stuff from, you know, when he was in the minor leagues, uh, accounts of things. I, I read every single article that was written about him in his college newspaper from his playing days, which was, that was a long day. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and kind of going through a lot of those things and really the way I structured it was I read the articles and did like the archival research first, moved on to the interviews to give me like a grounding of like, all right, so here's this incident. I'm talking to Brad Osmus. Let me ask Osmus what he remembers about this. You know, let me ask Chris Donalds what he remembers about this, you know, and, and kind of building things that way. And then, you know, just continuing to go back and forth with a lot of that. But yeah, it, it's really a combination of, uh, of the newspaper stuff or, or articles or even some videos. Um, and then, yeah, just some research and investigative kind of stuff. So were the people that you interviewed, were they reluctant at all to talk about it or were they like, oh yeah, you know, let's, I mean, were they kind of open books? There were really two reactions and that was, you know, that was them. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't any like, eh, let me think a couple of days and get back to you if I want to do this or not. It, people were either very gung-ho, um, like, yes, absolutely. I want to do this. I love that guy. I love talking about him. Um, and they were very willing to talk about everything that they knew. Um, and then there were some that were, yeah, I'd rather not talk about it, which is understandable. Like, you know, all these years later, it's still a, you know, a, a very sensitive subject. Like if you had a friend who died in a very tragic way, then I fully understand why you wouldn't want to talk to some idiot stranger you know, who's, you know, poking around in this for some reason after 16 years, um, you know. So, yeah, I, there were a couple people like that. Um, but for the most part, um, people were, were very willing to, to say yes to talking because they, they love Ken and, and they want to tell his story. And, you know, th I think there's a, a desire by a lot of them to have him remembered not just as the steroid guy who died of a drug overdose, um, but for the ball player he was and for the teammate and the father that he was that they remember him being. Um, you know, that's, that's the thing that I really took away from to everyone I talked to was, I mean, they all just sung his praises. All right. That's, that's really awesome. Just, um, just kind of think, oh, oh Jeff Bagwell and uh, Biggio, did you reach out to them or? Uh, I reached out to their agent um, okay. and did not hear back. Um, okay. 
which I again, figured, I, I figured I, that would happen. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I mean, I reached out to Trevor Hoffman, like he was close to Hoffman in San Diego, reached out to him through the Padres. He said no. So like those three were like the man, if I can get, you know, one of them, that would be amazing. Um, but it was, yeah, not expected again as, you know, someone who's just kind of independently doing it. Um, you know, the best I can say is like, yeah, I broadcast some minor league baseball. So why not talk to me about a, a friend who you really loved? Um, you know, right. I, I think if I were Richard Justice doing this, they might be more willing to, uh, you know, cooperate if, you know, I had a name, but I I, I don't. So I think maybe and, and Peter Gammons. Peter Gammons yeah. would have been a better one. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, what's coming up? You uh, you mentioned you've done your five, your five episodes. What's the sixth episode going to be about? Uh, so the sixth episode is um, his first two years in San Diego. So 95 and then the MVP year in 96. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of ground to cover there of just things happening. His steroids really starting to kick off. Um, a guy that he meets in Houston that kind of becomes his personal trainer uh, who then kind of falls off the face of the earth after Ken's playing career. Um, there's, uh, you know, after that, the 97, 98 seasons, which is beginning of a relapse um, in substance abuse, return to Houston uh, the last year of his career. Um, and then the post-career stuff. Um, which I will say the, the last two episodes of this show are tough. Uh, they were tough for me to put together um, and to record. I've been putting off editing them because I don't want to listen to them again just yet. But, uh, you know, it's, they're, they're not easy. Uh, I mean, there are some things in there that just, again, as I was reading it, I just, it makes you want to pull your hair out. Um, you know, I, I don't want to give them away too much, but um, there are some things that, don't paint the Astros front office in the best light uh, in the year 2000. Um, mm. There are some things that don't paint the Padres very well either. Um, and, you know, it's just, it is what it is. I mean, it's the business of baseball, but, um, and the way that we kind of dealt with things at that time. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty nutty. I, it's, I, I enjoy, um, putting it all together and uh you know the next five episodes are really some of the wildest stories you've never heard of um kind of coming back to light which is uh it, it's exciting to, to kind of drag some of it up and some of it is obviously very sad well i think too i think you i think people listening can appreciate the just the humanity of it um mm -hmm. Because, you know, life for these baseball players, um, life for athletes, life for celebrities is, is, is always so grandiose to you and me. Um, you know, you, you didn't give me much hope earlier when you're like, well, who would want to talk to a minor league announcer? I'm like, well, gosh, I'm just a podcaster. I'm not going to ask anybody now. Um, at least this guy's in the minor leagues. No, I'm joking. But, um, but, but the whole thing that you bring up um, – I think with the way you're doing it, um, it is it is a respectful thing. It's not one of these like hit pieces because you know, quite honestly, the public opinion of media of documentaries or whatever is, oh, they're just smearing their campaign. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of because I'm a history teacher, I teach Texas history, yep. and the one thing I hate the most is when history is rewritten incorrectly. I don't mind if you add the history for things that have been deleted. Um, but when you add things and change narratives, I hate that. Mm -hmm. And I always call it out on its face. And so I think for you to bring things up and you do it in an admirable way, in an honorable way, where you're like, hey, this is what it is. And it's just basically a biopic. Um, I think for Astros fans, um, they probably really dig it. Because like I said, growing up, he was the man. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, that guy, Ken Kennedy, was just, he was it for us. He was the guy that, you know, him, Biggio, Bagwell. I mean, those years with the Astros were so great. And, um, you know, you've got to be willing to take the good with the bad. Um, so question, do, do you have any other um, Astros players um, that you've thought of 
doing one of these on like I don't know I mean I know I'm not trying to go with like an eight but I know you know the whole Daryl Kyle tragedy I know Daryl mm-hmm. Kyle would be probably an interesting guy to cover um J.R. Richards you know are there are there any other Astros that maybe you've looked at doing doing something like this with or am I kind of putting the cart before the horse for you no no I I mean I've got I have a notebook that's got a couple pages worth of just ideas for future seasons. Um, you know, J.R. Richard is on there uh, for sure. I, I don't know if he's going to be coming up in the next couple, um, but he's kind of long-term thinking. Yeah, that that's definitely a, a story that I'd, I'd want to tackle. Um, Daryl Kyle would be a, obviously a, a tough one for the same reasons that Caminiti is a tough one. Um, it's, and I mean, it's a little bit about, sip- a different sort of situation with uh, yeah. Daryl Kyle. Yeah, and to think about, you know, some of those guys in that Astros clubhouse at that point, I mean, they lost Kyle and Caminiti within a year and a half of each other, um, you know, and, you know, with the timing of everything, of course, you know, the day after Caminiti dies, Astros win their first ever, you know, playoff series against the Braves in 04, um, you know, just – the emotional weight that had to have been on that team at that point is just, uh, I can't even imagine. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a couple there. I had mentioned Derek Bell. There may be a season coming up on him at some point um, <laughs> because he was just such a colorful guy um, or maybe even just one specific incident oh. toward the end of his career. Jose um, Lima. Lima yeah. Time. Lima is another one. Oh my goodness. Or you could do Moises Alou, how he tore his ACL on the um, on the treadmill before and the game. Pee on his hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I if I want to go really silly, I do like that. Is the thing like season two of this show is going to be a lighter topic? Uh, I, I can't do another heavy one after this. So it's oh, going to yeah, have to be imagine. something that's a little bit uh, a little bit. I don't want to say less depressing, but but certainly yeah. something that is um, you know more of a you know, will bring a smile to people's faces as opposed to a, oh my God. Um, because, you know, like you were saying, Brett, like the intention is obviously not for this to be a hit piece. And I'm glad it's not coming off that way um, because I feel like there probably have been, or, you know, some punchlines attached to Ken just because of the steroids thing or, or the drug thing over the years you know, I talked to one of his former college teammates who, you know, stayed friends with him throughout the years. And he was one of the first interviews I did. And within the first five minutes, like he was like grilling me, like, am I going to cooperate with you? Because I don't want to be a part of anything that's a negative reflection on him or any of this other stuff. So I finally put it out. I sent the guy the email. I'm like, hey, show's coming out. Um, And he listened to the first few and he called me and he goes, Hey man, you did a great job. I'm so you know happy that you're doing it. I'm like, oh, of everyone I talked to, you are the one that I wanted to like know that you liked this show just because of what your relationship was. Um, because I, I feel like you know we've all, in one way or another, probably lost someone that we loved far too soon. And I mean, you know how painful that can be. Um, and then in this fashion and you know, for them, some stranger to come around poking up, like you can see why you'd be a little hesitant or maybe on the defensive. And and so I wanted to make sure I give it the respect um, and to do this story, the justice that I, I think it deserves uh, and to do it in a, a serious kind of way. Like I'm a jokey person, but I, I, I don't, I don't joke around. This is very much like a, you know, NPR is doing this kind of a thing as opposed to, you know, me showing a lot of my own personality in the show. I, I just, I felt like that would have been inappropriate. So um, go tell us a little bit, um, like your, your title of your podcast, where they, can they listen to it and where can they find you on Twitter? It's uh, the show is called Secondary Lead, um, you know, season one, the rise and fall of Ken Caminiti. It is available wherever podcasts are found. So wherever you're listening to Lockdown Astros. Um, as soon as you're done listening to this um, and any backlog shows of Lockdown Astros that you have, you can go on over and, uh, and listen to that. Um, I, it probably will work well binged. So uh, honestly, like if you have a long drive coming up, um, yes. <laughs> load it up and you know let it go. All the episodes are 30 to 45 minutes long. Um, 
you know, so it's, uh, they're, they're pretty short and digestible uh, clips. Uh, they drop Tuesday morning. Uh, so just be on the lookout for them then. And uh, personally, I'm Joe Vasile, PBP, V-A-S-I-L-E, is uh, Hayes by my last name on Twitter. And the show is uh, at Secondary Lead on Twitter and Instagram as well. So uh, give us a follow there. And uh, certainly appreciate, uh, yeah, if you give the show a try. And I just followed you. <laughs> yep, there you are. Okay. <laughs> all righty. So, guys, that's all we got for this edition of the Locked on Astros podcast. Uh, Brett's, I'm taking a little uh, breather. And Brett's going to go solo next week. He's going to have some guests on and everything. And continue to listen to the Locked on Astros podcast. And make sure you go check out the, I know the draft is over or the N NBA draft is over but you can still go listen to some content. Yes, sir. Yeah, let me just tell them um, who we got coming up next week. Um, we do have um, Gabby from um, Locked On Red Sox. I have an author, an, an author coming on um, who wrote a series on the baseball gods are real. I also have a Greg Pryor, a former major league pitcher who was with the 85 Kansas City Royals and Clay Hensley will make up a spot from this week and join me next week. So it'll be some really, really good shows next week while Eric's out and give him something to listen to while he's out of town. All righty. So Joe, thank you for coming on and you're welcome to, once you conclude your podcast, you're welcome to come in and check in with us and um, good luck with everything you got going on. And hopefully you'll be able to call some minor league baseball games again. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Eric and Brett. Uh, this was a lot of fun. All right. Thank, thank you, you guys. And we'll talk to you tomorrow.